I want to talk with you tonight about one of the most useful, fundamental um, ideas and ways of being that I know of in psychology, which is also one of the central themes in Buddhist practice, which is equanimity. Equanimity sounds fancy. It basically means, as I, as I said, non-reactivity to the experiences we're having. Uh, while resting in a sense of of basically resilient well-being, calm abiding in your core, you allow experiences to come and go, but there's a non-reactivity in relationship to them. There's a kind of inner freedom in relationship to them. If you think about it, being relaxed means having relaxing experiences. Being tranquil means having tranquil experiences. Equanimity is non-reactivity to all experiences, pleasant, unpleasant, uh, relational or neutral. And um, so, for example, we can have experiences of great joy and great happiness, and we can remain in a sense of peaceful non-attachment to those experiences, even as they're occurring. This doesn't mean, related to a question that came in uh, from someone a little earlier, that we're not valuing um, these wholesome experiences of lovingness or gratitude or joy. Uh, it's just that we don't cling to them. Where There's a freedom. There's a non-reactivity, including not a grasping or a pushing away in relationship to our experiences. So you can see that equanimity is really a very profound thing. Or on the other hand, let's suppose that something happens for really understandable reasons. I, I offer a well-intended suggestion that just does relate to the ways in which that a, an upright posture does tend to promote alertness. And on the other hand, that might be associated with instructions, religious training, cultural training, sit up, uh, mind your manners, that is very reactivating. So those reactions arise. And as we develop over time, it's a training that's, that's progressive. As we develop over time greater equanimity, those reactions can arise and we don't need to be carried away by them. We can kind of, with a little bit of time, sort them out and then decide what we want to do. And we may, as this person really, to me, very charmingly points out, we may adopt the posture of someone like Eckhart Tolle, who in my view is actually profoundly realized uh, uh, in his way, certainly, who kind of slumps over when he meditates. So that equanimity gives us this buffer. It gives us a space between whatever we're experiencing at the time and then how we relate to it and how we act wisely, hopefully, uh, in reference to it. So I want to explore with you four principles of, of equanimity or four ways to cultivate equanimity inside yourself. And along the way, if you want to toss in questions or comments into the chat window, the chat sidebar, I'll see them. As I've said before, please use the chat uh, feature only if you want to. Uh, if it bothers you, just keep on moving. <laughs> from Raise your eyebrows maybe at some things that people say, but keep moving or turn off the chat feature altogether. If you do use the chat feature, please do so respectfully and focusing on sharing your own experience and focusing on your own practice. Okay. So um, with regard to equanimity, the first of the four basic principles is to understand your mind. Understand your mind. And what we can observe in our own mind directly is that we're having ever-changing experiences. And for biologically based reasons, there's a cognitive tendency, there's a tendency in the mind continually to try to slow the process down and hold on to things, to what's called essentialize them or thingify them, to turn passing experiences made up of many parts arising and passing away dependently, to turn them into things, objects, that we can then push away if we don't like them or hold on to them if we do like them or try to manipulate them and make sense of them. Um, this is inherent in um, functioning in the wild in terms of animal evolution. It's a natural and inherent process in the mind. You can observe it directly. But it's inherently frustrating because the truth is all our experiences are impermanent. They're not stable. They're dynamic even if they are fairly persistent. 
all of our experiences are compounded. They're made of many parts. So if we try to congeal them and unify them into a thing, we're running up against their actual nature. All our experiences depend upon their causes. If their causes change, the experiences change. So if we're trying to hold on to the experience, even while its causes change, that too is frustrating. The Buddhist mind trainings are very much about understanding this in a deep way that may begin conceptually uh, and then increasingly it becomes very clear and very immediate and you become, it becomes very granular and real time. Like, oh, and in the insight, the vipassana into the actual nature of all experiences as empty, made of parts and arising dependently, we begin to recognize their foaminess, their insubstantial quality, their cloud-likeness, and uh, which fosters a certain disenchantment in relationship to our own experiences. Disenchantment, waking up from the enchantment, waking up from the spell. It's a central theme in, in Buddhist practice. Um, has a word for it in Pali, the language of early Buddhism, Nibbida. Uh, and so in our disenchantment, it's not discussed. We don't you know, have a sense of yuck about our experiences, but we lighten up about them. We become less identified with them and we become more comfortable with abiding as the flow, the streaming of consciousness without um, thingifying or grasping after, you know, tightening our grip upon any particular experience we're having. This is a fundamental result of understanding your mind that comes from, um, that supports equanimity because it gives us an, a growing freedom in relationship to the experiences that we're having. Second aspect of understanding the mind is immensely practical. This insight into the foaminess, the emptiness, the cloudiness of experience, vipassana, is a progressive process. And it can take a while for it to feel real and useful. That's okay. Then, more grossly, <laughs> there's this sequence in Buddhism that has a fancy term, the chain of dependent origination. It's, it's kind of complicated, but the essence of it has four steps. This is the heart of the matter goes from contact, which means the recognition of a stimulus of some kind, whether it's uh, the sight of a chocolate chip cookie or the sight of someone whose politics you don't like on TV, contact. Then there's what's called the feeling tone or the hedonic tone, really, because it's not about emotion per se, of the experience that you're having or the sense of the stimulus as unpleasant, you want to get away from it, or you want to fight with it, or, or you freeze in relationship to it, or a stimulus is pleasant, it's desirable, you like it, you want to swim toward it, get more of that good stuff, right? Or in my view, or, or it's neither pleasant nor unpleasant, it's neutral, as it were, and so you go, eh, meh, and you move on to something more pleasant, or you look to avoid anything that would be threatening. I personally think there's a fourth feeling tone that's emerging in our evolutionary neuropsychology. You can distinguish and, uh, and identify in your mindfulness practice the sense of things as relational. And you can start to observe that there's certain experiences that are not some kind of arithmetic of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. There's something else going on here that speaks to our enormously social nature. And you can watch that there's certain, you can see the difference between, oh, I want to move away from that, unpleasant. Oh, I want to move toward that, pleasant. Or I simply want to abide with an awareness of relatedness to that, connection with that. You can get a growing sense of that. All three of which are distinct from none of the above, complete neutrality. In any case, in that sequence, contact, feeling, or hedonic tone, then there's a critical step. That's the crux of the matter. After the hedonic tone can come, and routinely does come, craving. The root meaning of which in the language of early Buddhism is thirst. It's a drive state. Something is missing. Something is wrong. Craving. Which then... Um, intensifies and develops and kind of gets more and more congealed and becomes clinging and then dot, 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 suffering. 
That's the chain of dependent origination. So we can work backwards. We can go, oh, I'm suffering. Look backwards to the clinging that fostered the suffering. Then look one step further back, what was the craving that fostered the clinging? And then, aha, what was the reactivity to the hedonic tone of the experience that fostered the craving, right? That fostered the clinging, that fostered the suffering. And equanimity essentially is the development of a buffer, a shock absorber, a space of freedom between the hedonic tone and the drivenness that can arise around it. And operationally, what equanimity can feel like is that the unpleasant can arise, but it doesn't bother you. It doesn't invade the mind and remain. There's coping with it. There's appropriate coping. You know, you put your hand on the stove and it's hot and it hurts, you pull your hand away. And then there's pain in your hand, but with equanimity, there's a spaciousness around the pain in your hand. It is what it is. It is unpleasant. It is the first dart, as it were. But with equanimity, we don't add second, third, fourth, fifth darts to the experience of our reactivity to the pain, our hatred of the pain, our anger at ourselves for the pain, our anger at others for leaving the stove on so that we burnt ourselves, all the rest of that. Equanimity is like a circuit breaker. It just stops the movement from the feeling tone of unpleasant, pleasant, neutral, or relational, and problematic drivenness and grasping and sense of selfing that tends to follow. A great deal of Buddhist psychology is about growing mindfulness of this space. And one example of that is that in what's called the four foundations or establishings of mindfulness, the Satipatthana teachings, the four. One of the four that the Buddha allocated is mindfulness of the hedonic tone. And in this mindfulness of the hedonic tone, there's mindfulness of what gives, what a, what gives cause to it, how it is shaped, how our conditioning, let's say, shapes whether something is unpleasant that others find more neutral, maybe. Um, and um, also, as with mindfulness of the, of the hedonic tone, the feeling tone, we become very mindful of what quickly follows after. Okay? So understanding your mind, understanding both the nature of the mind process and developing insightful disenchantment and spaciousness about it while recognizing its nature, and also recognizing this room for room to move <laughs> between the hedonic tone and our reactions to it is so useful. In real time, often you're doing this retrospectively. You know, you're upset about something or you're addicted to something, you really want something pleasant, as Karen is writing here in the chat. Um, <clears throat> and then you work backwards. You go, oh, wow. You know, it was pleasant. I liked it. But then I added. Something got added to merely liking to it, liking it, and insistence on having it. There's a distinction between liking and wanting. And in that space is a freedom. There's a distinction between disliking and aversion, wanting not. And in that space is our freedom. There's a distinction between relatedness and trying to hold on to other people or impress them or to pull things from them for yourself. And in that space is our freedom. So that's the first principle of equanimity. And obviously, we could talk a lot more about that, and the Buddha sure did. Second principle that um, relates to this way of managing the brain's evolved tendencies to move from unpleasant to fighting, fleeing, freezing, or to move from pleasant to greed, attachment, possessiveness, addiction, okay? Um, in terms of that, the Buddha really emphasized being careful with aversion. And this is where I, as an evolutionary neuropsychologist, <laughs> uh, I really appreciate the brain's negativity bias. 
We are very, very affected by what's unpleasant, including in other people uh, that we find unpleasant, uh, uh, the way people treat each other, reactivity to things we find unpleasant in the chats, let's say. Be very on top of, really manage aversion. That's my second basic principle of equanimity. Really manage aversion and aversive reactions. And respect um, the ways in which the brain is designed to look for things to be aversive toward. It's designed to look for bad news. And then as soon as it sees it, it just over-focuses upon it and overreacts to it and over-remembers it and then becomes progressively sensitized to that which were aversive. That, that to which we find aversive over time through the activity of the stress hormone cortisol uh, in the amygdala, which in the alarm bell of the brain gets sensitized by cortisol, while meanwhile cortisol weakens the hippocampus, a nearby part of the brain that regulates the amygdala and puts things in context. Um, and also it, the hippocampus signals the hypothalamus to quit calling for stress hormones, enough already. So in other words, we're very vulnerable to becoming more aversive to things over time, to become sensitized to the unpleasant over time. So I think it's particularly important to really manage aversion, irritation, you know, making it real here, irritation, exasperation, disdain, contempt, dismissal. Uh, dehumanizing others, getting increasingly prickly. And one example of that that I can speak of for myself, and I, maybe I'm not alone, is that in these current times, as we're dealing with, for me, I think of them as three tyrannies, the tyranny of the plague, the tyranny of global climate change, and the tyranny of authoritarianism. And I'm using the word tyranny a little loosely, but it gets at, for me at least, the felt sense of it, that something oppressive um, and powerful and gl global <laughs> is bearing down. And there are other tyrannies. Obviously, for many, many people, there is the tyranny of racial injustice or systemic forms of other kinds of oppression and mistreatment. Absolutely. From my own, from my own place of privilege of different kinds, you know, I'm certainly aware of the three tyrannies, and I'm not saying there are only three. But with regard to those, we tend to get primed. You know, they're irritating. They're, they're aggravating. They're frustrating. There's so much we can't do. Uh, they stir up feelings of moral outrage, injustice, uh, being stunned that all three of them are human-made. Global climate change, you know, poor public health reactivity or, or responses rather to COVID-19, authoritarianism, human made. Ugh. So we get primed by these tyrannies. Of, in, and then your partner loads the dishwasher the wrong way <laughs> or tells you how to roll it the right way or whatever. And ba-boom, that little tiny nothing lands on that priming of aversion. We're very vulnerable to priming aversion. And then the trigger lands, and we overreact to it. So being very careful, really managing aversion, and really managing the priming of it as best you can, which means a lot mindfulness and disengagement and not fueling it yourself. And if it's present, if you know when you walk in the door, <clears throat> as I did when our kids were younger, coming home from work, stressed and kind of irritable, really be on top of your game then and manage yourself, knowing that you're already a little edgy, for example. Really manage aversion. That's the second major principle of equanimity. By the way, equanimity is not apathy. Equanimity is not deliberately turning away or being an ostrich with your head in the sand. Um, for me, equanimity with its qualities, true equanimity, which has a warm-heartedness in it. It's not cool and, dis and dismissive. It's warm-hearted and engaged with the world, helping it to be better. This open-hearted, equanimous, moral engagement with the world 
is in my view, absolutely at the heart of Buddhist practice and at the heart of all the other wisdom traditions in the world, including secular humanism. Okay. Third major principle that I'm offering here, see what you think, you know, have equanimity about what I'm offering too, of course, is to grow the good. Grow the good. Deal with the bad, turn to the good, grow the good. In other words, compensate in part for the negativity bias and its tendency to make us more increasingly aversive over time by developing through cultivation whatever is wholesome in you, a greater sense of grit and resilience, a more compassion for others, more compassion for yourself, a more positive mood, which is, much research shows, a major factor of long-term health, uh, authentic. In, you know, more positive mood and well-being is a factor of physical health and resilience over time. People recover faster from trauma and from setbacks and losses if their resting state mood is is fundamentally more more content and and peaceful. Um, so grow the good. And you know, I have a lot of offerings about that, about how to cultivate, how to take in the good, how to develop, um, you know, the good inside yourself. Uh, this doesn't mean to look at the world through rose-colored glasses or deny what's problematic. Actually, it's really scruffy, full of moxie, uh, self-reliance to grow the good inside yourself. Because as we grow strengths inside of all kinds, all kinds of strengths, including skills with other people, awareness of one's own unregulated biases of different kinds, or just simply cluelessness that that is getting really stale. Um, you know, as we become more aware of these things, we become more skillful. We become more able to cope and function and have good things we can offer to other people. So grow the good. Grow the good. Don't just really manage aversion. That's half the story. You know, yeah, really manage the weeds. Okay. But also grow the flowers. And I want to uh, make a little comment here. I'm, I'm, as you know, I think there are three primary ways of engaging the mind productively, practicing, in other words, three major kind of categories of practice. Be with what's there. Second, um, reduce what could be called negative, what's painful or harmful or both, and grow what's good, grow what's positive, uh, foster it, protect it, nourish it. In other words, we can witness the garden, pull weeds, and plant flowers. It's interesting that we understand that there really is a place for the second and third of these, which are under the heading of wise effort in the Buddha's Eightfold Path. We, we understand this with real gardens. <laughs> you know, you gotta deal with the weeds, plant flowers, you know. We understand this in any walk of life, you know, deal with what's problematic, what's wonky, what's wobbly, what needs repairing, and then, you know, develop what's positive. But suddenly, sometimes people balk at engaging wise effort inside their own mind. As if, and it's the one thing that somehow, oh, this general principle of wise effort you know, deal with the bad, grow the good, that is so used in all kinds of areas of your life. You know, if your plumbing is leaking, you want a plumber who can fix the leak and make things right, you know? But why not do that with our own minds too, if that's useful? So there's a place for that. So in my second and third principles of equanimity, I'm talking about really, really dealing with aversion, really managing it, being on top of it, not suppressing it, but managing it and also growing the good along the way. And then the last that I'd like to just offer, um, and something that's been very, very real for me uh, these days, as I've gone through my own kind of trajectory in facing the ways I've just fed up with the three tyrannies, as I call them, and then sorting out what am I gonna do about it, the little I can do out in the world in terms of public policy and who I'm for and who I'm going to vote for and all the rest of that, um, and especially practicing inside my own mind. And the fourth principle here of equanimity could be described in different ways. Um, find what endures. Shift from the ephemeral to the perennial. Yes, deal with ephemeral short-term issues, you know, the squabble in your family that you got to deal with tonight or the thing that's happening in your body or your business or something like that. Yeah. But, and, you know, consume, be, be to, you know, be aware of what's happening politically and culturally as you choose to, you know, being aware of it. But what, what's more perennial? 
you know, I find myself, at the, particularly at this stage of life, and, and partly I'm because I'm able to do it, to include in my awareness increasingly nature that is perennial, that is enduring. The wild, the nature, the sky, the stars, the ocean. Uh, my wife and I just watched this marvelous movie, My Octopus Teacher, on Netflix. Some of you may have seen it. In South Africa, this remarkable fellow documentary filmmaker spends a year in relationship with um, an octopus uh, that he is very connected with. And it's very touching. You know, the enduringness of, of, the, of nature, that's perennial. What do you find that's perennial rather than what's ephemeral and fleeting? Uh, relatedness, the field of relationship, good people. You know, uh, even if we live under tyranny of one kind or another, not to minimize it, by just say, but saying, okay, how do we live meanwhile, right? What endures relationships that are meaningful and, and good, the connectedness with others, with good people, as in this gathering on Wednesdays, as a sense of enduring. And for me at least, or, or more generally, personal practice. You know, no matter what's happening around you or what tyrannies you're dealing with in your own s s situation, there's always the space of practice. How do we practice? with what we're experiencing, including if you have a mind to it, those depths of practice that can feel somewhat unconditioned, as the Buddha put it, beyond or distinct from conditioned arising and passing away within ordinary reality. You might ask yourself, what is for you? You know, How might you have become overly preoccupied with or invaded by what is really ephemeral, you know, not to minimize what's harmful, especially for others. Sometimes very ephemeral things can have lasting impacts on people that are terrible. I'm not at all trying to dismiss that. I'm just saying that sometimes we can get overly caught up in the passing drama. It's like every day, you know, if you listen to like traffic reports on the radio, where I live, there's a highway called Highway 17 between essentially south southern San Francisco and Santa Cruz. Every day there's an accident on Highway 17. It's a winding, twisting one. It's a different accident, but every day there's an accident there. Well, that, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for the people who have to live through that, obviously, but so much of the news is the accident of the day, the dumb thing somebody said, you know, or did. And so my point is, are we getting too preoccupied with what's ephemeral? And meanwhile, what is more enduring and perennial that we could rest our attention in, that we could take refuge in, that can help us deal with what's, yeah, relatively ephemeral and still bad and needs to be dealt with? So that's my talk. Uh, equanimity, the feeling of it, open-hearted, warm-hearted, calm-abiding, that's engaged with life skillfully, with a fundamental non-reactivity to whatever, the flotsam and jetsam, streaming in consciousness, supported by these four principles of understand your mind, really manage aversion, grow the good, and find what endures. Okay. So, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, I see questions in the chat. Many, many, many good questions, wonderful questions. Um, so I wanna talk about what it looks like from Bonnie to manage aversion, because I think that's really key. So we manage aversion in part by being mindful of it, okay? And, you know, practical people, you know, like a checklist. All right, manage aversion, get a sense of it. Second, some of us, including just temperament or life experiences, have become more aversive over time. And it's, it's important to recognize that and accept that about ourselves and not shame ourselves for being kind of an aversive character as if that's shameful or bad. You know, often it's because life experiences landed hard on innocent, vulnerable children. And understandably, I mean, these, these, these neurobiological mechanisms evolved for a purpose. They were adaptive. They increased the odds of survival and passing on genes that passed on genes, right? So it's understandable if, if you're more of a, 
a melancholy or irritable or anxious kind of person who tends toward aversion. So that's the second key, I think. Third um, is obviously, as always, deal with your circumstances as best you can. If there are things in your world that are just endlessly anxiety provoking or irritating or hurtful or betraying or undermining or disrespectful, do the best you can with them. You know, of course, like that. Another is um, support the body. You know, sometimes we get more aversive because we're tired, we're hungry, we're experiencing some kind of imbalance in our gastrointestinal tract. We need better microbiota, you know, something. Pay attention to the body. That's another one. And then another one for aversion is to give yourself time. Aversion arises. Okay, that's the first start. Can you not add second, third, fourth darts to it? So somebody says something, contact, irritated within a second. Okay, can you stop right there and just be with irritation as an experience without adding a righteous case about what an asshole they are? <laughs> right? I'm speaking from experience here. Uh, Right? Can you right? can you just leave it be? Or then there's the first start, and then you throw in your righteous case. Okay, got it. <laughs> Let those be two first starts. Now stop. <laughs> Don't add any more to it. Right? Can you? And and with practice, you get better and better at that. Now maybe you find yourself throwing five darts in a row. Okay, next time can you just throw four darts? And with practice, three darts. And then increasingly, it arises, it's, it's, it's unpleasant, but it doesn't bother you in the core of your being. And you can gradually move on to the next thing. That's a process of practicing with aversion. And then I would add, in a way that's authentic, and that's important for the timing of this, we be with what's there, we be with what's unpleasant, and then maybe we do some things to reduce the negative that follows, we reduce the planting of new weeds, as it were. And then in the natural rhythm, not as a spiritual bypass, it can really help to turn to the good. What could soothe the aversiveness? Maybe a simple pleasure like washing your hands or taking a fuller breath or remembering that octopus movie. Or this is a really cute ad now from KLM, which is a Dutch Airways with this little beagle who can really smell lost objects. So the beagle will find the lost object and then run through the airport <laughs> finding the person who left their phone there or the little kid whose stuffed doll was dropped on the floor and then return it to them. It's so cute. Think about that. You can find it online these days, KLM, beagle, dog, something, <laughs> lost and found. It's really charming. Um, so you know, turn to something like that, that's comforting, that's soothing, whatever works for you. The feeling of soft flannel. Oh, did, I loved my pajamas when I was a kid. Soft flannel, yum, yum. Uh, something that smells good, something you like to eat, read a book, you know, something. You know, that can also really help to manage aversion too. And um, then over time, if you really want to, you can use the link step in the heal method where you link positive to negative and you deliberately are aware of what you found aversive or the experience of, of anxiety or uh, anger or immobilization, the three kind of classic forms of aversive response. You're aware of that off to the side of your consciousness, your awareness. While what's prominent in the foreground, in the link step, and I've written a ton about this in my book, Hardwiring Happiness, taught a lot about it, you can find more about it elsewhere, um, is that you, um, uh, you um, uh, are aware of two things at once, and you can even have a sense of the positive resource going into the anxiety or irritation or helplessness or just being present in your mind alongside it, keeping the positive bigger. And since neurons that fire together wire together, you can gradually use that positive to release and eventually even replace um, that negative material, soothing it along the way. I summarized right there a, a, a number of therapeutic techniques that, that differ in the details, but the essence is kind of that process of being aware of two things at once such as the caring and support of another person that is affirming and encouraging while you feel something that, let's say, you feel hurt about or, or helpless about or worried about.
that that's an example of linking in ordinary life. Okay. All right. So I'm looking at the chats, equanimity. You okay with this? Yes. Scrolling through, hanging in there with it. Equanimity is a good thing. All right. Know what it feels like to be equanimous. That's really useful. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So I'm kind of picking various general questions. I'm seeing all these sweet things coming in. Um, I forgot to mention, so forgive me for just mentioning it right now if it's okay. In, I think, two weeks or so for the Garrison Institute, I'm going to teach an online workshop uh, on Saturday and Sunday morning, four hours each day, I think, on my neurodharma material, which involves some really deep experiential methods, which certainly support equanimity. And if someone can find that, uh, a link to that and put it in the chat, I'd appreciate it. So if that interests you, um, it's a benefit for Garrison Institute, which has been really hammered as many retreat centers have been hammered by COVID. Um, you know, you could check it out and see if that interests you. Okay. So I'm looking for other things. Jed asks a really interesting question, and this goes to a interesting uh, idea in Buddhist psychology called the near enemy. So is stoicism equanimity? This is interesting. Stoicism, you know, and Jed may know more than I do about it, and certainly there are philosophers who know a lot more about the stoic philosophy. Um, for me, there's a certain emphasis in it of a kind of numbing inside and a, and a certain not experiencing anything. With equanimity, and this goes to a really key point that got brought up earlier, we are, because we can be equanimous, we can experience even more fully and intensely because we're not invaded in our core by what we're experiencing. The intensity of the pleasant, the intensity of the unpleasant, we can open to it. For example, equanimity enables us to really be heartfelt in our compassion for the sorrows of others because we can bear them with equanimity. Similarly, equanimity allows us to really yum, 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 enjoy the pleasures of life without getting addicted to them, without grasping after them. So we can experience even more intensity in the pleasures in life. And you can see this in the in people like the Dalai Lama who you know meditates three to four hours a day, uh, really a cultivation of equanimity, who can be both moved to tears by what is happening to the people of Tibet under the tyranny there of the Chinese government calling a fact a fact. And then within minutes can be laughing with joy when someone shares with him maybe a a video of a beagle running through an airport, <laughs> you know, in Amsterdam. And so, um, you know, equanimity in that sense, I don't think of as stoicism. You know, I think of stoicism, perhaps incorrectly, as, you know, not having intense feelings of any kind. Equanimity is non-reactivity to all experiences, mild to intense of any kind. Equanimity is the central disruptor, central circuit breaker, central buffer, shock absorber, uh, between the stimuli of the world and the experiences arriving in, arising in the mind and the um, cascade of craving, clinging, and selfing that in the Buddhist analysis fosters so much suffering. Okay. Um, so many awesome comments and statements here. Oh, I'm getting nervous. What am I going to do? Okay, Rick, be equanimous with that fear of missing wonderful questions. Um, great, great, great. Let's see. Da, da, da. Oh, okay. Wonderful question. Uh, where am I here? Endurance and impermanence for Margaret B. at 722. And if you use your name, I'll I'll say your name. And you can change your name in the Zoom structure by just, I think, clicking on it and somehow changing your name. Anyway, so Margaret, uh, how do you deal with both endurance and impermanence? I once believed the stars are forever, but now I can't see them anymore, I presume because of smoke in the air. Uh, and redwood groves have burned to the ground. Oh yeah, very true. Well, within conditioned reality, Almost everything is impermanent. For one, all experiences 
are impermanent for sure. Now, within conditioned reality, I think the area of a circle on a plane as pi r squared endures. If you think about it, certain things are not impermanent in the Big Bang universe, such as the fact that whatever has happened will always have happened. So there are some exceptions to the rule of impermanence in material reality. But fundamentally, um, the fact is that things do fade, right? They do change. Smoke comes, stars are obscured, even the stars themselves burn out. Our own sun, roughly four billion years from now, will gradually use up all the hydrogen in its core as a giant fusion reactor and start chewing up you know, heavier and heavier atoms, uh, which will then cause it to expand and become a red giant for a few million years. And as the sun expands in the normal sequence, becoming a red giant, it will swallow up first Mercury, then Venus, then our own Earth. You can look around. Wherever you are, the hills around you, you know, the Grand Canyon, El Capitan, Mount Everest, the Mona Lisa, all gone chewed up as the sun gradually expands toward the asteroid belt and toward Mars. Mars will get really hot, but it'll be spared, and then the sun will gradually contract over millions of years into becoming a white dwarf. That's a natural process. Yeah. So what do you find enduring? You know, uh, I know no matter what, I'm going to keep loving my children to the rest of my life. I hope they're going to keep loving me, you know? Uh, what endures, I think, inside oneself, if you can find it genuinely, and I assume you can, is a plucky sense of, I'm going to keep on trying. I might get frozen for a while, I might get knocked down, I might get shocked horribly. But after some reasonable amount of time passes, I'm going to gather myself and start sorting out what I'm going to do next, All right? That's enduring. Uh, to me, nature as nature endures. The redwoods may burn extinction. You know, few species last more than a few million years. And still, life endures, right? So find for yourself. And for me, um, the ultimate refuge, and I do believe the Buddha pointed to it, is that which transcends conditioned reality and is therefore not subject to arising and passing away. The Buddha taught all that is subject to arising will eventually pass away. But if something is not subject to arising in the first place, in other words, if it transcends meaningfully distinct from the ordinary conditioned Big Bang universe, it's not subject to passing away. It is unconditioned and therefore the ultimate refuge, the deathless, as you put it, the farthest shore, the, dom the domain of Nibbana, that's the ultimate uh, enduring refuge in the Buddhist frame, and spoken of also in other wisdom traditions. So I would just say that. Um, awareness endures in a very down-to-earth sense. The contents of awareness are continually changing, but awareness itself as awareness is stable. It's like a stable screen on a TV through which passing experiences move. So. Find for yourself what you find, or it's relatively. You know, maybe it's ultimately ephemeral, but it's relatively stable. <laughs> you know? It's a lot more reliable than the passing show. I mean, for me, I, I'm looking at emails or I'm tracking political Twitter because, of course, I'm deeply interested. I got it. And then I look out and I see the hills around my home. Uh, I'm on the edge of open space, and I, I'm confident that native people walk through my, you know, my backyard. That endures. I know the land that I foolishly claim as my own on unceded ground. Uh, you know that land will still be here. I see trees that I know will live past me, outside me. They may well only make it a few more centuries, but I know they'll endure. So find for yourself what you can take refuge in that is more enduring. Okay, so let's sit together. The sense of community of other people who are practicing, you know, I, I think of the history of practice, clearly extending 5,000 years to the first written records, and then 
for me, almost, you know, certain, in my view, certainly extending before that, people of good heart who've been attempting to practice as long as humans and even our hominid ancestors have walked the earth to try to try to ease suffering, to be more skillful with the mind, to find what is a genuine refuge, you know, the fact of practice. To me, that's a refuge that endures, including the sense of fellowship with other people here who practice on Wednesday nights. So let's sit together for a minute. Just let it sink in. Can you rest your awareness in whatever you find helpful? May you find a growing sense of equanimity that's genuine with a warm heart engaged with the world. May all beings find a genuine sense of equanimity with a warm heart helping the world. <laughs> 